peace, blessings and mercy of God be upon you. In 1991, while Mrs. Munir Abdullah was standing on her way home, a traffic accident caused this lady to suffer serious brain injuries. At the time, she was 32 years old. So far, this story is nothing strange. Unfortunately, many of us hear about similar intuitions. But the strange thing about this accident is that Mrs. Munayai fell into a coma after this accident, which lasted for 27 years. And the strangest thing is that after all these years, and by a divine miracle, she passed and returned to her life again. And according to the same scenario, in 1982, the French football player Jean-Pierre Danjou, who was playing for the Paris team, while he was performing an operation, and because of a mistake by the anesthesiologist, Jean-Pierre entered a coma that lasted for more than 39 years, and he died without exceeding of, which, on September 6, 2021. One of the many questions that arose at the time was about the different endings, how did these people survive all this time? Welcome. I am Mohamed Saleh, and in this episode of Science Solve a Question Baffling Us, we will answer the question of how someone who has been in a coma for years can still live without eating or drinking. And before we start, if you are still new to the channel, don't forget to like and activate the bell so that our videos will reach you first. Scientifically, this condition is described as a state of lack of awareness and lack of response due to the intuition of brain cell damage, specifically in the part that connects the brain to the spinal cord. And the parts that stop from it are the ones that are responsible for thinking. People with a vegetative state are able to perform some normal processes, including breathing, an increase in heart rate, yawning, eye opening, or sleep cycle adherence. But on the other hand, they are unable to do anything voluntarily like they move their eyes, speak, or pay attention to any sound around them, it is impossible for them to feel themselves or the environment around them. And of course, they don't show any signs of affection or awareness towards anything, no matter how strong its facilitation is. It is worth noting that there is a difference between the vegetative state and coma in its well-known sense. In a coma, a person is able to wake up and sleep again because he is in a state of complete unconsciousness and this is unlike the vegetative state, as we mentioned. Another difference is that it is impossible for a person in the vegetative state to get over it after a week or two, because in this state he is not considered to have entered into a coma. Basic vegetative state Because this condition is considered a long-term disorder, painful in some cases, and it usually lasts for more than a month, and it is rare for the sufferer to regain any mental function or ability to interact with the environment surrounding him after a short period, and now it remains after we separated the familiar coma from the vegetative state. How do people who fall into this state survive these years? We want to say, in principle, that the patient can continue to live while he is in the vegetative state, as the matter is not easy at all and he needs preventive measures in all steps. And this is because of two problems, one of the most difficult things they face is any patient who is going through this condition. The first of them is the inability to invade naturally. The best solution to this problem is by providing gases using gaseous tubes. Those who enter the body in two ways, either through the nose, until the gas reaches the stomach, or by inserting it directly into the stomach or small intestine. This is what happens through a surgical incision in the abdomen. In both cases, it is called tube gasification. But in some cases, a catheter is inserted into the vein, through which food enters directly, and this is called intravenous nutrition. And it is not only the food that is delivered in a feeding tube to the patient. Medicines also enter the body in the same way. And the food that enters this body is a mixture of artificial nutrients as an alternative to food. The main goal of this support is to increase the amount of muscle tissue and muscle mass of the body. In addition to providing the calories it needs for the body and the vitamins and minerals that the body needs as well. It is worth noting that the gasification of patients with this vegetative state is not constant or the same in all cases. Each of them will have their own nutritional requirements that differ from the requirements of the other person. Thus, before starting the invasive support process, doctors determine from the beginning the amount and mix of invasive elements that this particular patient needs. And what doctors usually determine, using some indicators, which are like the building equations in the body and which are calculated by the patient's weight, gender and age, and the changes imposed by the disease on him, not only do they calculate the basic needs and requirements, but they constantly amend these requirements and follow up any changes that occur on the patient so that they do not cause an increase in his need for calories. 
some specialized centers use very accurate techniques in calculating people's needs. By measuring the amount of oxygen that is inhaled and the amount of carbon dioxide that is exhaled, which is considered an accurate indicator of how much energy the body needs. In addition to what we have mentioned, doctors are also forced to constantly monitor other factors. Body mass index, amount of fat, muscle tissue, and muscle strength. But regarding the first problem facing patients with this condition, it is a problem of how to get the appropriate nutrition. The second problem they encounter is the problem of lack of movement. There is no doubt that nutrition alone without a solution to the movement problem will be useless. The problem of immobility itself is divided into more than one implicit problem. For example, we have bed sores. Sleeping in one position is the main reason for cutting off the blood supply to this area, which in turn causes cracking of skin cells and thus blooming bed sores. In order to solve this problem, we need to change the position of the person frequently, and we put protective pads under the parts of the body that are in contact with the bed, such as the carbo area, for example. The second problem we face is that the lack of movement can cause stiffness and a permanent shortening of muscle work, which in turn causes permanent joint problems. In order to prevent this problem, the physiotherapist comes and gently moves the person's joints in all directions, or what is medically called passive range of motion exercises. A problem followed due to lack of movement, the occurrence of blood clots. Lack of movement is the most suitable environment for the formation of blood clots and the places that are most susceptible to a stroke are the leg veins, which are called deep vein thrombosis. To solve this problem, doctors resort to different methods of preventing clotting, either by using medication or by lifting the person frequently. This is because moving the limbs helps greatly in preventing the formation of clots. And the last problem is with people who suffer from urination. And what is the result of the failure to perform its role normally? This is one of the most serious problems in our case. Because one of the most important conditions for a patient with a vegetative state is that his skin is constantly clean and dry. In this case, a tube or catheter is placed in the bladder to drain urine. Although the vegetative state until this moment has no specific treatment. However, all the steps and care processes that we mentioned are the main reasons for the survival of patients from this condition, God willing. They are also the main reason that they can continue their lives normally if only they were cured from the vegetative state. In the end, the main reasons that can even enter a person in a situation like this are that there is significant brain damage or in a way that causes brain functions to malfunction. And this happens either in head injuries or any disturbance in the brain, from oxygen, such as a heart attack, respiratory arrest, or brain bleeding. In the end, we wish a speedy recovery for all patients with vegetative state. Just like that, and as usual, if there is a question that comes to you at night or day and confuses you, write it to us in the comments under the video so that we can answer it. And if you liked the video, don't forget to like and share, and if you are watching us for the first time, do a subscribe and activate the bell so that our videos will reach you first. I will see you in the next episode, bye. Money. What's the first thing you think of or feel when you hear that word? Is it grief, joy, anger? Really, think about it. Does the word money inspire positive or negative feelings? Or maybe you're that one person in the bunch who's just like, meh. I recently did a survey with people who subscribe to the Spirit Science email list and asked a wide number of questions. One of which was, what do you struggle most with in life? The number one highest response was, you guessed it, finances. This told me it was time, at long last, that we have a candid spiritual discussion about money. See if we can't change our relationship with physical resources. I mean, think about it. What would happen if there were like a hundred thousand benevolent spiritual millionaires all using their wealth to make massive and beautiful change in the world? Hmm. Well, let's talk about it. Allow me to begin today by asking you a question. What would you do with a million dollars? If you're anything like me, you might go to work putting those resources to use benefiting humanity in some way. For me personally, 
I want to work with a big animation team and video production studio and make an amazing stream of content for YouTube and Spirit Mysteries, and maybe even one day launch a worldwide theatrical release of something really special. But hold on, we can't even do that at all yet. There's a big money blockage in the way. Ugh. But what is this block, you might ask? Well, it's a pretty big one, and it's existed for thousands of years in the relationship between money and spirituality within the human consciousness. I discovered this blockage for myself nearly nine years ago when I created this little cartoon series. You might've heard of it. It's called Spirit Science. <laughs> Sorry. Of course, there's a lot of praise on this series, but a lot of people also warned me with grave and fear. Spirituality and money don't go together. If you make money doing something spiritual, you are a sellout. Now, I very often take all the comments to heart, even these ones. And for the last nine years, I struggled with this whole money and spirituality thing. I chose to avoid looking at the conversation in general sometimes because I didn't wanna upset my audience, you guys. But what I found was that choosing that paradigm forced me into a very limited box of reality. As spirit science grew, I had more and more responsibilities, but I didn't usually have much in the way of resources to delegate tasks. So I just had less time to spend on making videos as a result. The next thing you know, people were mad at me for not making more videos. Talk about being stuck between a rock and a hard place. The reason I'm telling you this story is because I know that I'm not the only one who is has or will one day struggle with this problem. But I have good news for you. We can transform the entire dynamic and it all comes down to the relationship that we have with money and our spiritual selves. This applies to anything really. Literally any problem can be healed and transformed if we understand it fully. If you are someone who has ever struggled financially, you've come to the right place today everything begins to change. Understanding money actually begins with a conversation not about money, but with God. <laughs> you could call it spirit, the all, the source field, the energy that makes up all of the particles and wave forms of reality, whatever floats your boat. You see, spirit is found in all things. There is nothing separate from the eternal oneness. We have this conditioned idea in society that God and the heavens are always above us and beyond us in some way. But what about inward? What about outward? What about even downward? Oh, no, no, sorry. Don't think of downward. That's the devil's lair, right? Well, even the devil is not separate from the supreme oneness. At the deepest level, we have to understand that everything is spiritual because all things are connected through this infinite field that makes up reality. That goes for money too. Now, I understand that it may be difficult to comprehend the idea of God or spirit, and that's often the point. The hermetic philosophies describe God to be unknowable and indescribable because the imperfect and impermanent cannot easily apprehend the eternally perfected. But fear not, because with every day, every moment, each of us has the opportunity to explore deeper the mysteries of life and the connection we have to this underlying substance behind reality. Substance is a very key word here. It will be critical in bridging the gap between this cosmic discussion and money. You see, there is a substance underlying all things. We understand scientifically that when you zoom in close enough to the bits of reality, we find a seemingly never ending field of energy continuous field of energy that is never depleted or empty. So even if we are experiencing lack in our lives, the energy substance that makes up everything is never lacking in anything. The lesson here is that through the awareness that energy is everywhere and constantly permeating all things, we come to know that there is this foundational abundant stability at the basis of everything. In a very spiritual perspective, we can perceive this as if the whole of God is present at every moment through all of space and time. Limitation as we know it does not actually exist. What does exist, however, is the consciousness of limitation. There are pockets of poverty. There are victims of deprivation, absolutely. And simultaneously, there is an infinite and universal energy from which all things descend. 
We exist within this energetic field, just as a fish exists in water. With that mindset, can you ever truly run out of ideas and opportunities for health, love, and prosperity? The key then to limitless wealth is that this endless substance can move through you if you open yourself to being a conduit for it. And it can take so many different forms. It can take the form of creating happiness, health, food, money, or any other kind of experience that you want. Generally speaking, we open ourselves to experiencing this abundance through our creative ideas, ingenuity, and will to do good work with a loving heart. So with all of that as a primer, what specifically is money? Well, the simplest way to look at it is energy, a reflection of a value exchange that you can create in the world with others. As you create value, others are willing to exchange their own energy for it. And money is the physical reflection of that energy. But be warned, not all money is created equal. Money can be created in a positive or a negative way. You can have a thousand dollars of selling heroin to addicts, which is, well, pretty dirty money actually. Or a thousand dollars of supporting people in creating deep personal transformation in their lives. Much cleaner money. The biggest lesson I've learned about money lately has been that in order to start creating it, we have to be willing to shift our mindset, change our belief system about it and look at it differently. Doing this, we open ourselves up to a new paradigm where we exist with a spiritual fullness that creates wealth as well. You have to be willing to love money just as much as you love other aspects of life. Not that you're making money into like the thing that you're all about, but honoring it as another foundational aspect of life, along with other things like food or growing a garden or I don't know, going to the gym or watching a movie. Now, not to get super biblical, but there is an interesting quote that I wanna share from Jesus who says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We must remember not to base our security on that which is physically manifested, but on the inner energy within you. When spiritually rooted, making money is not the end goal, but happens as a result of one's good works in the world and supports you in continuing the good work at greater levels. We've been taught a lot of things about money and a lot of those things aren't true. Today, we smash those money myths once and for all. Money myth one, money is the root of all evil. You've probably heard this one before, right? Tell me, where did you first hear this idea? Parents, church leaders, friends, maybe family members? It's an idea that's been passed down for generations. And today we find it deeply ingrained in our belief systems about the world. But allow me a moment to let you in on a secret. Are you ready? The first time that this quote made it big was actually in the Bible from Timothy 1. Now what's interesting about the book of Timothy is that for so long, these writings were attributed to St. Paul. However, it is now recognized by most scholars that Timothy, along with nearly half of the other writings attributed to St. Paul, were inauthentic writings that simply signed his name on them. The reason why this is so significant is that when you get into the original writings of St. Paul, you find him using all kinds of language that would indicate he was actually a Gnostic mystic, practicing an early Christian version of the mystery schools. In fact, there are books written about this subject alone. At the top of the list, I recommend The Gnostic Paul by Elaine Pagels, The Jesus Mysteries by Timothy Freak and Peter Gandy, and The Book of Spirit by your very own Patchman. We're going to do a whole series about this in the future once the Sumerian epic is done. But for now, let's stay on the subject of money. The reason I'm sharing this with you is because many of St. Paul's original writings were very pro-mystic teachings, but later on, the Roman Empire adopted Nicene Christianity and forged some letters from Paul, including the book of Timothy, where they say that the love of money is the root of all evil, along with legendary phrases like, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Jeez, Timothy, you hate money, women? What's next, homosexuality? Oh, you, yes, indeed. Ah, <sighs> sorry, I, I need a sec. Seeing things like this makes my stuffing come out. <clears throat> As you might be aware of, the Holy Roman Empire passionately and violently insisted that everyone follow their specific version of Christianity, leading to a very depressed society and culture that would be both very patriarchal and impoverished for at least a thousand years. 
And these belief systems are still lingering about in our consciousness today. It's wild. I posed this very question on a poll on Instagram and Facebook a while back and asked, the root of all evil is either money or ignorance. And the response was pretty divided with about half of the audience saying that money was the root of all evil. But here's the thing, that myth, it's a trap. It's an idea that keeps poor people poor just by believing it. Just think about it. If you're poor and you believe money or having an appreciation for it is the root of all evil, you're going to consciously or subconsciously avoid having it at all costs. Having money will either consciously or subconsciously make you feel like you're going to go to hell if you have it. And so you get rid of it the moment that it shows up. Even if you're not religious, the idea could arguably be ingrained in the mass subconscious at this point as well. In this same vein, it's interesting to see how the original phrase got so misinterpreted. While it's impossible to say for sure where the translation got mixed up, it probably lies in the original translations. See, the original Greek phrase read, for the root of all evil is the love of money. But it does have multiple interpretations and translations. For one, the phrase money can also be translated as silver. Maybe Paul was secretly a werewolf. During the reformation period, Martin Luther translated the phrase as avarice is the root of all evil, which incorporated greed and hoarding into the question. Most people agree though, that Luther referred to the love of money in strong accusations against the Catholic church because he saw the whole idea of paying your way out of hell as inherently sinful, something that the Catholic church at the time was very guilty of. Perhaps the general mindset regarding money changed around this time. In the pardoner's tale of the Canterbury Tales, the pardoner expresses a similar mindset by explaining that he can preach all about how avarice and money are evil while using his position to disguise the fact that he himself engages in such a disharmonious relationship with money. As far as things relate with us, we should be mindful that as creators of our reality, participating in this field of collective human consciousness, that our beliefs about ourselves and the world dictates what kind of actions that we take. If we feel that either money is the root of all evil or just loving it or appreciating it is evil, then we limit ourselves from learning about it on a deeper level. Think about it. If money is a reflection of energy and everything is energy, and the energy from which all things are created is, as we've explored in a spiritual sense, this universal unconditional love, then why is it that we practice unconditional love for everyone and everything except money? Of course, we should cleanse ourselves of our greed and not make the pursuit of money be the only thing that we are after at the expense of everything else, our connections with each other and whatnot. But if we outright deny this important aspect of life, we ultimately give our power over to the people who would use this collective wealth in negative ways. Just something to think about. Money myth two, all rich people are. I'm not saying that. Money myth two, all rich people suck. Let's look at another money myth, specifically the way that wealthy people are commonly viewed in society. There's an ingrained mentality that rich people are all greedy jerks, right? Generally, most people with tons of money are wrapped into the elite ruling class of the world. In fact, the more money you have, the more likely you will be associated with the Illuminati by conspiracy theorists. Now, you've probably heard this one, filthy stinking rich, right? This common mentality sets a standard for yourself that you could never have lots of money because anyone with money is filthy and stinky too. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> I mean, think about it. If all rich people are greedy jerks, I mean, you don't wanna be a jerk, right? So it's probably best that you're not rich. Now, let's be clear. Certainly there are rich jerks in the world, but there are also poor jerks. And considering that there are significantly more poor people than wealthy people in the world, we could probably make a good argument that there are more poor jerks than rich ones. Either way, here's the key. Money is neutral and it will basically amplify what's already there. If you're benevolent, money can help you be more benevolent. If you're a greedy jerk, yeah, money can make you more of that too. Now let's be clear that a lot of money has been made extorting others in the world. And that's not a paradigm that I support. And I get that this is where a lot of our collective negative associations towards money comes from, but we have to temper that attitude by observing others who have done brilliant things with their wealth. If we adopt the idea that all rich people are greedy jerks, then our minds automatically try to find ways to throw shade at good-hearted people. And even if you genuinely don't like them for whatever reason, we have to take into consideration that they are people too 
and they're doing their best with the position that they're in to make a positive change in the world. If we are willing to look at money differently as something that we can use benevolently for the benefit of mankind, then we open up the potentials of us actually creating it and we step into a new way of life for ourselves and those around us. Money Myth 3, it's all about the deals. Speaking of our collective relationship with money, let me show you something both funny and very interesting. To begin though, I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Ariel. She's one of my new artist friends who is helping to create the new Spirit Science episodes. And when I spoke to her about this script, she sent me this picture with a lol attached. It's a meme that seems to accurately describe our collective relationship with money and our perspective of value. Healthy groceries for $100. No, that's too expensive. But a dinner date for $100. Well, you know, that's reasonable. A therapist for 130 bucks. That's absurd. But a trip to Target for $130. Well, they've got great deals. Now an average college class might cost $1,000. That's way too expensive. But an iPhone, that's $1,000. No, 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 that is a necessity. To me, this meme accurately describes a mindset of lack. We've been conditioned to think in deals instead of what's truly valuable. The result of this is that it becomes easy to miss out on potential opportunities to invest in ourselves and our personal growth. That's also the other side of money, not just making it, but spending it, which is so valuable for us to learn and integrate into our lives. Every time you spend money, you are investing your own personal energy into what you believe is valuable. So the question then becomes, what do you value most in life? Yes, you could spend $1,000 on video games, or you could spend that same $1,000 on a backpacking trip around some foreign land, or maybe taking a specialized course to help you get better at doing something that you love. I think James Frick said it best when he said, don't show me where your priorities are, show me where you spend your money and I'll tell you what they are. Money myth four, you have to be a cheapskate. There's a common mentality about living on a budget and if you live on the cheap, you'll save money and one day you'll have a big pile of dollars. However, you create your own reality. And if you're focused on this cheap mentality, then that's what you'll continue to create. On the other hand, if you change your mentality, your focus to generating wealth rather than pinching pennies, imagine how your reality could be different. Money myth five, financial freedom. Most people believe financial freedom means having enough money so that you don't have to work. But this myth is broken because having financial freedom today doesn't mean you'll have it tomorrow. Instead, try the term financial confidence. This means knowing that you have the skills and ability to make money no matter what happens. It means you never feel like you have to be at the mercy of external forces when it comes to your financial life. This is what it means to truly be open to allowing that cosmic energetic stability to permeate your life as we discussed before. Now that we've shattered some classic money myths, it's time for us to begin really rewiring our consciousness and putting ourselves into a place where we can start opening to making money and getting to that place where you never have to worry about it again. Let us begin with a psychological experiment that describes how we view money in relationship with value in the world today. In this particular experiment, people were asked to judge five different glasses of wine presented at various prices from $5 to $90. Before drinking, participants were told how much each bottle of wine cost. After tasting them all, the participants generally agreed that the most expensive wine was their favorite and the cheaper ones were their least. Now, maybe you saw this coming, but it was later revealed that the wine presented as a $90 bottle and the wine presented as a $10 bottle were actually the same drink. That means that in the mind of the taste testers, the price tag itself changed their perception and gave them a better or worse experience. Not only did participants report enjoying the same wine with a higher price tag more, they even had increased activation in regions of their brain hypothesized to be associated with pleasure. This study teaches us a few valuable lessons. One, it would seem, is that the more you pay for something, the more you tend to value it. This is commonly reflected in an analogy about books. If someone just gives you a book randomly, you're less likely to read it than if you're personally invested in buying it. We can also see this with wedding rings in society today. You might be familiar with the fact that diamonds aren't actually very rare, but they have a long history of being marketed as if they were, so they could be sold for very outlandish prices. Because of this perception of value around them though, a wedding ring that costs $10,000 versus one that costs only 100 
says a lot to the young couple due to the value that's been attached to it. Now, I'm not saying that it's a good thing that cheap diamonds are sold for thousands, but rather, if we can recognize the relationship between price and personal value, we can make better choices about what we spend our money on. Actually, let's stay on the wedding rings for just one more minute because this is relevant. The first recorded evidence of a wedding ring concept actually appears to have come from ancient Egypt over 3000 years ago. The writings depict couples presenting each other with braided rings fashioned from hemp or reeds, which would eventually be replaced with bands of either leather, bone, or ivory. The more expensive the material, the more love was believed to be shown. The hieroglyphs show that Egyptians believed that the rings symbolized undying commitment and eternal love between the couple because the circle has no beginning or end, with the center opening symbolizing a door to the future. The reason I'm sharing this is that we have this curious tradition that would take an individual's love and demonstrate it with the symbolism of both the ring and its material, which would then translate into a physical value and worth in a monetary sense. However, we must always remember that the money doesn't buy love and that even in the Egyptian tradition, the love came first and the ring was a reflection of the love. While the material and its value played a part, it was more of a psychological trick, if anything, giving couples a sense of feeling that their love was indicated by the worth of the material of the ring. This is significant because it's not so much the dollar value that's necessarily important, but how much something is worth to you personally. For some people, $1,000 is a lot of money, an astronomical amount. For others, that same $1,000 is not worth very much at all. So we each have a different identification with our perception of value, and this is important to identify if we want to shift that at all. On that subject, let's look at value in another way, from the perception of the service provider. In the case of someone who is offering a product or service, sometimes having a higher price tag is actually the best possible choice because it will allow for a higher quality of service. For example, let's compare going out for a premium dinner versus the drive-through at McDonald's. There's an entirely different kind of experience here and the environment itself will most certainly play a part in how you feel personally about the experience, not to mention the quality of the food, the cleanliness of the environment, the atmosphere, everything. I don't want to say that it's always best to go with the most expensive route, especially if it's unnecessary in that particular situation. In truth, sometimes premium is better and other times it's better to just let all that go. For example, it's like the difference between a fancy trip on a cruise around the Caribbean or a camping trip to a beautiful place a few hour drive from home. Now in this thought experiment, notice what happens in your mind when we look at these two options. It's not uncommon for people who can't afford a luxury cruise experience to immediately start judging it as negative because it's out of one's reach. And if you're someone who is, well, for lack of a better word, fully loaded, how do you feel about camping? And I don't mean glamping. I mean a tent and a fire and just being in the rawness of nature. Does the experience feel beneath you? These two potentials could both be wonderful, but our perception and relationship with money will often dictate how we approach the options we have in our lives, and more importantly, how we feel about them. In my life, I once had a friend who absolutely hated Apple computers. Apple was the worst, he would declare, and list off all of the ways that Macs sucked and why Windows was superior in every way. He was very passionate about this subject. However, after several long conversations, eventually the truth came out. He hated Apple products because he couldn't afford them. And if he could afford a MacBook, well, he'd probably love it. The hate and disdain that he felt towards this physical product actually had nothing to do with the product at all. It was all about his own sense of value and self-worth and the negative relationship that he had with money. So the question then becomes, how do we shift this? How do we transform our relationship, evolve our mindset when it comes to money? The first stage in wealth transformation is to recognize our limitations where we are living them. If we have fixed beliefs about who we are and what we're capable of or not capable of, we'll have to break these down if we are to evolve beyond them. We can't break free without calling out our blockages. True transformation begins within and that's where we must start. Speaking to this further, the most widespread disease of our time may very well be I can't-itis. It is contracted by many of us early in life from our elders and peers. In fact, society has made a song of it that has neither rhyme nor reason, but it's heard everywhere. I can't because I'm poor. I can't because I'm sick. I can't because I do not have ability. 
I can't because there's no opportunity. Or perhaps I'm just very, very old. And so on and so forth. Few people use more than a small part of the tremendous God power within, but you can alter the pattern of the I can't tune. And in fact, you must. There is no progress in the realization of prosperity unless you do so. This calls for knowing, really knowing that you are a spiritual being living in a limitless universe endowed with the whole potential energy flow of the cosmos. If you believe I'm an average sort of person, then you will create an average sort of life. Let go of I can't and begin to identify yourself as the living enterprise of the infinite one. You are not an average person. You are you, a unique individualization of the universal creative process. Affirm for yourself now, I can because I am. So are you ready to make some money? Or perhaps you need a bit more time affirming the cosmic power within you. You can only become truly accomplished at something you love. Don't make money your goal. Instead, pursue the things you love doing and then do them so well that people can't take their eyes off you. Civilization's currencies have evolved and devolved throughout history. While gold and silver have always had value and a long history of being made into coins, Egypt's grain-based resource economy is another example of how things have been done in the past. The bottom line is currency has changed drastically throughout history. And today we are no different. As new technology is breaking barriers between us, we can and have been for some time communicating around the globe at unprecedented rates. No longer does the geography that separates us separate us emotionally in terms of communication. For transactions, this isn't any different. You can buy international goods through companies like Amazon, which allow almost anything to make its way around the planet. Technology is what makes this possible, but in the same way that the internet revolutionized communication, some people are claiming that cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are bound to revolutionize the world of money and exchange. If this happens, our system of material value would completely be decentralized from any one nation. The reason Bitcoin was invented was to give the power of currency back to the people, or so they say. As it is now, most people's money is held by a few massive centralized banks. Though of course it's against the law to steal their customers' money, there is nothing else really preventing them from doing so or otherwise manipulating our currencies in their favor if they can get away with it. In fact, this is what happened in the global financial crisis of 2008, when banks started taking more and more risks and eventually going bankrupt. But even though the fallout of this harmed normal people around the world, the banks were forgiven by a government bailout. This naturally gave a lot of people mistrust for the centralized banks, as well as the government. They felt trapped by letting these institutions be in control of something so integral to all of our lives. So Satoshi created Bitcoin, a currency that could not be manipulated from a central point, but had enough security and rarity to convince people to own it. In fact, you can even read in the first block of the Bitcoin blockchain, 2009 Chancellor on the brink of the second bailout for banks. We won't get into exactly how Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies work for there's plenty of other videos that explain that, but we will briefly say that one of the biggest appeals about cryptocurrencies is the fact that they can securely handle transactions without going through a centralized agent or third party. Basically, this means that nobody runs Bitcoin. There are no Bitcoin police, presidents, corporations. There is only the blockchain. The blockchain is a growing list of records with an encrypted message that tells you who has how much currency. It's continually encrypted with new information, which can be decoded over and over to reveal the true history of all transactions. The message doesn't grow in length, but by continually decrypting each block, you can effectively see the transaction history back in time. The longer this blockchain of history is, the more secure the currency is because it gets harder to tamper with each time. And Bitcoin is getting pretty long. But sure, Bitcoin may be secure, you say, but what value does it have? Well, often when talking about the value of something, economists refer to its hardness. No, this isn't physical hardness, but it means to describe how difficult something is to find or create. One reason gold has been so valuable for so much of our history, despite its limited practical use, is that it's been hard to fake and hard to find. In other words, it's secure and rare. The mysterious creator of Bitcoin, who is only known as Satoshi Nakamoto, took this into account too. Bitcoin is mined and given out to holders of the currency who helped secure the network through computing power. But every so often, the amount of Bitcoin given out decreases. 
until eventually none will ever be created again. Generally in the blockchain, Bitcoins are registered to Bitcoin addresses, which requires nothing more than picking a random valid private key and connecting that up. Creating a private key can be done in seconds, but guessing or hacking one is so hard that it's practically unfeasible. To be able to spend your Bitcoins, you need to know the corresponding private key and then digitally sign the transaction. On the downside though, if you lose your key, you can say goodbye to all of your gold since the Bitcoin network won't recognize them anymore. In fact, in 2013, one user claimed to have lost 7,500 Bitcoins worth 7.5 million at the time when he accidentally discarded a hard drive containing his private key. I bet that was a fun dinner party conversation. So if security and rarity give something value, then the buzz around Bitcoin seems to make a lot more sense. And the dream some have of cryptocurrencies replacing normal money is a bit harder to argue against at the moment. But the idea of a decentralized currency system is an intriguing one. A world where no money is owned by major corporations or governments? That would sure make corruption and greed harder to emerge. So can you buy a hot dog with crypto or a car or a house? Am I going to get rich by putting my life savings into Dogecoin? Maybe, it depends on the fluctuating value. Let's be clear though, this video is in no way financial advice, but we will be exploring the idea of a world in the future, which has adopted the idea of a decentralized currency and what benefits and consequences that will bring. At last, it's time to explore how you can create your spiritual money right now. Now you might be familiar with this material, but for those who aren't, allow me a moment to introduce you to two men and their legendary book, Napoleon Hill, Andrew Carnegie, and the book, Think and Grow Rich. This book is truly the ultimate spiritual success manual, having sold over a hundred million copies and helped to create more millionaires in the world than you can count. This book came about in 1937, when a man named Andrew Carnegie commissioned a young Napoleon Hill to write a book about how he became the wealthiest person of his generation, the world's first billionaire by today's standards. I mean, technically he wasn't a billionaire, but with the inflation of the dollar, today he would be several times over. Now, just to get this out of the way, I feel it's important to note that for those who read it, you'll probably notice a bit of a sexual bias in the language used. The book was clearly intended written for men when it was published in 1937. That said, the principles they explore are relative for anyone who is on the journey of wealth transformation. And while I don't support the sexist attitude, the core information is valuable to explore. This book documents the ultimate success philosophy and formula for anyone who is seeking to generate wealth in a way of thinking that mirrors the understanding of the ancient Greek mystery schools. I'm not even joking. This book literally teaches how to create wealth in your life by being psychic. Allow me a moment to share a few key passages to show you what I'm referring to. Truly thoughts are things and powerful things at that when they are mixed with definiteness of purpose persistence and a burning desire for their translation into riches or other material objects. More than 40 years ago, the author working in conjunction with the late Dr. Alexander Graham Bell and Dr. Elmer R. Gates observed that every human brain is both a broadcasting and receiving station for the vibration of thought. In a fashion similar to that employed by the radio broadcasting principle, every human brain is capable of picking up vibrations of thought, which are being released by other brains. Yes, all of this was written in 1937. Now, when you begin to think and grow rich, you will observe that riches begin with a state of mind, with definiteness of purpose. The author reminds us that our state of mind is of the utmost importance. Success comes to those who become success conscious. Failure comes to those who indifferently allow themselves to become failure conscious. He concludes the introductory chapter by informing us that if we can learn to follow the 13 principles of thinking and growing rich, literally anyone can lead a wealthy and prosperous life. Going over the principles take up the majority of this book, but allow me a moment to run through them with you. Principle one is desire. We must have a healthy desire for what it is that we want. This is akin to being able to consciously focus on what you're wanting to create for what we think and feel actively creates our reality. If we choose to just get what life gives us, then certainly we're not going to end up with much. We have to be clear about what we want and be willing to go after it. Principle two is faith. Quoting directly from the book, faith is the head chemist of the mind. 
When faith is blended with thought, the subconscious mind instantly picks up the vibration, translates it into its spiritual equivalent, and then transmits it into infinite intelligence, as in the case of prayer. Infinite intelligence is often used to describe God or spirit. Principle three is autosuggestion, a term which essentially means self-suggestion, the agency of communication between the conscious and subconscious minds. This is your ability to program your own subconscious mind by making sure to feed it creative and healthy thoughts instead of destructive ones. Principle four is specialized knowledge. There are two kinds of knowledge, general and specialized. General knowledge is the kind of stuff you learn in school, random bits of history and math and literature and stuff that by itself isn't really good for much. Specialized knowledge, on the other hand, is knowledge that is organized and intelligently directed towards the fulfillment of your dreams. Principle five is imagination. What they describe to be the workshop wherein all dreams and desires are given shape, form, and action. There are two forms of our imagination, the synthetic imagination, which arranges old concepts, ideas, or plans into new combinations, which doesn't create anything new, and the creative imagination, which is the mind-opening bridge to infinite intelligence, which allows you to conceive of entirely new concepts, the faculty through which hunches and inspirations are achieved. Principles six, seven, and eight all go together. They are organized planning, decision, and persistence. This is the practical ability to form definite practical plans of action, making decisions on them and executing them consistently and persistently until you begin to see results. Procrastination is the killer of dreams. So while you might be worried that, oh, I mean, what if I don't make the right decision? Any decision is better than sitting there and doing nothing. And you always continually refine and improve as you go. Speaking to persistence, Napoleon Hill explains that one of the most common causes of failure is the habit of quitting when one is overtaken by temporary defeat. Every person is guilty of this mistake at one time or another. When defeat overtakes a person, the easiest and most logical thing to do is quit. And that's what so many do. However, failure is a trickster with a keen sense of irony and cunning. It takes great delight in tripping one when success is almost within reach. Principle nine is the power of the master mind. The master mind may be defined as coordination of knowledge and effort in a spirit of harmony between two or more people for the attainment of a definite purpose. It basically means don't try and do everything yourself. If you can team up with people to achieve a vision, do it. Principle 10 is the mystery of sex transmutation. Yes, the mystery of sex transmutation. Very simply, it means the switching of the mind from thoughts of a physical expression into thoughts of some other nature. I'll just leave that one here, but it's a very interesting chapter. Principle 11, 12, and 13 are called the subconscious mind, the brain, and the sixth sense. And it's when this book really becomes a mystery school of its own. They explain that our minds are receivers and emitters for thoughts and emotions into the collective field of consciousness, that we're connected to everyone, that we must train and use our subconscious for connecting to infinite intelligence, AKA source, spirit, or God. And through opening to infinite abundance, we begin to direct ourselves toward the creation of value in the world, which produces wealth as a result. We also develop the faculties of our psychic mind, the sixth sense through which infinite intelligence may and will communicate voluntarily without any effort from you. This is the apex of the philosophy, but which can only be truly mastered once the other principles have fully been understood and integrated into the psyche. The book concludes with a final chapter on the six ghosts of fear, where they describe that the sixth sense will be blocked as long as you embody the following fears. The fear of poverty, criticism, ill health, loss of love of someone, old age, and death. We must tackle these fears and overcome them within us through meditation and other conscious engagement with ourselves. And this will support us in activating our own sixth sense. Now, I know these 13 principles alone are a lot to digest, so you might need to rewatch this video and take notes. But that said, there's one more thing from this book I must share with you. Think and Grow Rich also describes the six step action item formula to begin creating your spiritual wealth right now. Take note 
If you want to completely transform your financial reality, I encourage you to pay close attention to the following. Step one, determine what you want to achieve or accomplish. Decide what your goal is. Your goal must be specific enough that you know when you have achieved it. It is also important that you are emotionally engaged in achieving the goal. Your desire for the end result must be strong enough to motivate you to do what you need to do even when you don't want to do it. Step two, decide what you are willing or need to give in return for what you desire. Nothing worthwhile comes without a price. For example, time, money, a change of habit, etc. What changes do you need to make to your life or lifestyle that will allow you to achieve your goal? Step three, set a specific date when you want to achieve your goal by. This gives you a set timeline to work with as you develop your plan. Step four, develop your plan. Begin at once, whether you are ready or not. What steps are you planning to take that move you toward your goal? Do not wait for the plan to be perfect. Start right away. You can and will make adjustments as you go. Step five, write a clear and concise statement of what you want, when you want it, what you are willing to give, and the steps you plan to take to achieve the goal. Step six, read your statement out loud with emotion a minimum of two times a day, first thing in the morning and right before you go to sleep. This is the most important step in the process. And adding to this, visualize yourself as if you've already achieved your goal. Do this as often as you can during the day, even if only for a few moments. And that's it, but fear not. Our journey into spiritual money is not over yet. There are still some very important things we have to explore. Change our mindset, transform our financial reality. Sure, that sounds easy enough, right? But what if we're feeling stuck? What if we don't have enough time to transform our reality because we're too busy making ends meet? Well, not to worry, because it becomes easy to shift our paradigm if we can clearly see where we're at in this moment. And now that's exactly what we're going to do. We all have different stories. You have your own set of unique experiences, beliefs, and ways of looking at the world. Once you know your wealth archetype, it becomes very easy to focus in on what information will be the most useful to you in this life. The six wealth archetypes are the caged lion, the chained magician, the hustling treasure hunter, the innocent prisoner, the castaway, and the unfulfilled king or queen. As we go through these, feel into which one feels most like you. Beginning from the top, Picture that you are a caged lion, the king of the jungle, wild, fierce, born to hunt. But one day you were captured by hunters and put into a cage. You say to yourself, I'm gonna get out of here and then you'll see how dangerous I am. But over time, you grow tired and soon you're thrown a piece of meat. You try to resist it because you are the king of the jungle, but you need to survive and so you eat it. Day after day, month after month, you slowly become accustomed to eating the meat you are given. You're not starving, but you're not truly satisfied. You get trapped in this routine and there's this voice screaming inside of you, frustrated, angry, and impatient. Then the doubt creeps in. I've been stuck in this cage for so long. Do I still have what it takes to hunt? What if I can't survive on my own? The caged lion is the frustrated nine to five employee. They are the people who know they can provide for themselves, they can be successful in life, but they have sacrificed that life for the predictable routine, even though it makes them miserable inside. But what if I told you the key to unlocking the cage is dangling right in front of you? And sometimes the lion tamer leaves the door unlocked because he believes you don't have the guts to step through it. Well, let's move on for now, but we will return. The second archetype is the chained magician. Imagine you are a powerful magician you have powers most people can only dream of. You are full of creativity, energy, and imagination, boundless energy that allows you to think fast, learn fast, and act quickly. However, the village elders around you have prohibited you from using your abilities so that the other people in the village who can't use magic won't feel threatened. Your powers are unique and different and go against conventional wisdom. And even though you can bring great change for your village, the elders warn that staying with tradition is safer than trying something new. The chained magician represents all of the millennials and new generation of talent who feel suffocated and pressured by their parents and society. People who have heard their whole lives 
play it safe. Nobody in our family has ever done this before. You can't make a living doing that. Get a degree, get a good job, get married and buy a house and so on. Remember going on your own path instead of what others have told you doesn't mean you don't love them. You might feel alone and misunderstood, but as you go out in the world and pave your own trail, you discover that there are far more magicians like you out in the world. You can take the chains off anytime for the only one who can stop a magician is themselves. Next, we have the hustling treasure hunter who loves to go on adventures and find the next biggest chest of gold. They love the thrill of the chase, the allure of a new opportunity, going after the shiny objects in the sand. But it seems like finding treasure maps excites them more than the actual search for the treasure chest itself. When they find a new map, they exclaim, you just wait. Once I find the treasure, I'll be set for life. You'll be sorry you missed out. However, as they follow the map, they realize it requires them to chart rough seas and uncompromising landscapes. And so they quit. They say, Gah, there was no treasure. The map lied, but don't worry. The real treasure map is out there and I'll succeed on my quest. These are people with lottery mentality, believing external factors are what determine success. They jump into the latest money-making schemes like Bitcoin, network marketing, drop shipping, day trading, etc. They announce they've found the opportunity of a lifetime, but when it doesn't work out at first, they are quick to jump to their plan B, their plan C, and their plan D. If we recall Think and Grow Rich, however, we all face temporary setbacks and we must be willing to persist through them to gain our wealth. The hustling treasure hunter can achieve great wealth as long as they can follow their map to the end with passion, commitment, and love. The fourth archetype is the innocent prisoner. Imagine you were jailed for a crime you didn't commit. How would you feel if you had followed all of the rules, played by the book, and did everything right and still ended up a prisoner? These are the people who did well in school, got good grades, listened to their parents, maybe even earned a scholarship. Perhaps they became doctors, lawyers, accountants, engineers, but deep down, they still aren't fulfilled. They appear successful on the outside, but inside they are stressed, burned out, and empty. Some even take antidepressants to aid low humming anxiety. They say, I did everything I was supposed to do. So why do I feel lost and empty inside? What did I do wrong? The biggest struggle here is that they don't think they can stop living this way because it would be irresponsible. So they bottle it up and the feelings get worse. The mistake of the innocent prisoner is believing that conventional wisdom was the key to happiness instead of listening to their own heart's calling. The fifth archetype is the castaway. Imagine you are in a plane crash in the middle of the ocean, the only survivor who washes up on shore. You realize you are truly alone and you must fend for yourself. You build yourself a shelter, you hunt your own food, and you even make a fire. But every day it's a hustle. You can't preserve food, so you're always on the hunt, always just surviving. This routine becomes your life for years. The castaway is the struggling solo entrepreneur. You are starting your own business, but you feel alone. Every day is a struggle, hunting for food and water to survive. You're always on the lookout for new clients or fulfilling the jobs of others. If you get paid, you can afford to eat. And when you find your first client, it's like starting a fire for the first time. You want to celebrate, but you have no one to celebrate with. The castaway has to do everything in their company and never quite making it to the point when they can rest because if they stop working, they will not survive. The mistake of the castaway is living life as a lone wolf. While they have what most consider freedom, they are lonely and they have no long-term sense of future certainty. Finally, we have the unfulfilled king or queen. This was the person who conquered many obstacles and are finally sitting on the throne. It wasn't easy. You've worked hard for years or decades to get to this position and you have everything you've ever wanted fortune, lifestyle, and status. But for some reason, your happiness is fleeting. Instead of joy, other things fill your mind. What if other kingdoms attack or try and take you over? So you build up your army or fortify your defenses and you feel satisfaction for just a moment. And then another fear sets in and you itch for the next achievement. This archetype is the overachiever, the one who was always at the top of their class worked hard, succeeded in life. Perhaps it's a talented CEO, an executive, senior partner, or other high up position. But deep down, 
They're afraid that their peers will outperform them and strip them of their title that they've worked so hard for. But from this place of motivation, achievement does not lead to happiness. It's a trap. They have to achieve more and achieve more and inside they are always unfulfilled. The mistake of the unfulfilled king or queen is the one who finds it hard to be satisfied unless they outdid everyone else. But as a wise person once said, you can't win the race of fulfillment running on the track of achievement. Now, this brings us to the end of our wealth archetypes. Do any of these sound like you? If so, don't worry, and you're not alone. And I have good news for you. Each and every one of these has a solution for it, if not multiple solutions. Now, we're going to explore some solutions very soon. However, if you're interested in going deeper into all of this, I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to the book from which these archetypes come from. It's called Unlock It by Dan Locke. Unlock It is Dan's latest book, and it is truly a spiritual successor to all of his previous work. For me personally, Unlock It really helped bring a lot of clarity to my own understanding of wealth and value creation in the world. So I highly recommend giving it a read. And if you're interested, you can find links in the comments below to get yourself a copy. In my own spiritual wealth journey, learning from many books and some amazing mentors, I have found that creating money actually boils down to one simple thing. Are you ready? Here it is. Wealth is a byproduct of value creation. Let me say this again. Wealth is a byproduct of value creation. In fact, creating value generates so much more than just wealth. Value creates meaningful experiences, deep connections, authentic transformations, and so much more. You can see this in several ways in the world, both in how it works and how it's broken in society, stemming from our understanding collectively and individually. We often complain about these rich people ruling the world, and certainly they are people with massive wealth in the world and they influence society in literally whatever direction they want. And it's not always heart-centered. Now, for just a moment, let's put the lack of heart aside and look at this from another perspective. How did they earn it? For example, in the case of all these super rich oil men, they provide the global human society with a source of energy that's in very high demand. They're creating value for billions of people and are thusly some of the richest people in the world. We know that there are better, cleaner sources of energy and that these people may even fight to suppress those industries, certainly. However, if we're looking purely at how these people got so wealthy, we can still see that they created value. Same with any other massive company, Apple, Microsoft, McDonald's, Walmart. They all grew to being these billion dollar companies and industries by providing some kind of service. Whether it's healthy or not aside, that's how they did it. They provided something that millions or billions of people want to spend their money on. But let's not just focus on these oil tycoons and other massive companies. Is it possible to create value in a healthy, positive way? Well, certainly. How about JK Rowling, who through her passionate writing inspired and influenced generations of people with her incredible storytelling. The results, she almost became a billionaire. Same with Oprah, who used communication, listening to others, and an exploration of the unknown to inspire tremendous wealth which she still uses today to influence the global conversation in the direction of love, wisdom, and spirituality. We can also look at Vishen Lakhiani, the creator of Mind Valley, who supports a massive community in the awakening process, helping people connect deeper with themselves and each other. If we can understand the relationship between value creation and wealth, we can plant the seeds of new industries and establish a new generation of spiritual business, or at least establish for ourselves a method of working and creating resources in the world that is in alignment with our spiritual centers. You can see this big disconnect then when you ask the average person, how do you make more money in life? Most commonly, you'll hear the response, well, you put in overtime, you get more shifts and you work harder. However, what you'll find is that the results of this mentality are like the approach, a little diluted. If you're working eight hours a day and getting paid minimum wage and struggling to get by in life, the solution is not working 12 hours a day. That's just a recipe for becoming burnt out, stressed, tired, and maybe even a little neurotic. Think about it. Instead of working harder at a low income job, the key to solving your financial problems is by creating work for yourself in the world that offers greater value to those in need. How can you be in service in a greater capacity? And if you truly want to be in spiritual alignment with yourself, 
Can you do so and also do something that you're passionate about? Now let's explore a practical example here. If you're working the checkout at a grocery store, the amount of value that you're creating is not very much. That job is easily replaceable. It doesn't take much training. And so the companies who are hiring checkout people are not going to pay you very much because that's how much it's worth to them. And please understand, if you work at a checkout in a grocery store, this does not mean you are not valuable. Just this particular skill is lower on the value ladder. But imagine now a good programmer, an artist or an animator, or a specialized skill that is less common. These are skills that are in high demand and low in supply. Companies will hire quality skilled individuals and pay them very high amounts for producing quality material for their company. In fact, sometimes companies are based around it, like Apple being started from Steve Jobs' garage. Even Spirit Science was started in my parents' basement, built off of nearly 10 years of personal practice animating and learning, which stemmed purely from my own interests and passions. So the question you have to ask yourself is, what value are you adding to society or your community at large? In my wealth journey, perhaps one of the most practical perspectives that I've learned to make this understanding real in how to bring value and create wealth in the world is that it really all does boil down to skills. Now, in the past, I've spoken about Dan Locke. In my experiences of Dan, he's like a fusion between a Taoist monk, a Kung Fu master, and an ancient Chinese military leader. That is, if you were to merge all of those together within a soul and make him a very heart-centered, compassionate businessman. Dan's mission is the elevation of wealth and financial confidence in the world. And he does it by helping people to elevate their minds and supports them in being in service to humanity in all manner of ways. The reason I bring this up is because Dan speaks often on the subject of high income skills. He explains this dichotomy of skills, value and wealth creation and teaches that if we want to generate more resources in our lives for the use of making life better for both ourselves and society at large, we must learn skills that are in high value and doing so provides you with financial confidence. Knowing that you have the skills to generate wealth by offering high value service to others gives you the confidence that even if something was to happen and you lose all your money, you'd have the skills necessary to produce more because you are a valuable person with valuable skills. Everyone is valuable in life, but some skills are more valuable than others based on how easy they are, what they take to learn, how much effort is required to get good at it, and so on. This, in my understanding, is the bridge to the creation of wealth. Can you pair your own inner value with a valuable skill to become an instrument of service for the world? Speaking of value, there's something else that is tremendously important here, even more valuable than our money. And please take this super seriously if you want to shift your financial reality. Your time is far more valuable than money. Time is, in this dimension, a limited resource. And while yes, we are striving to evolve into a species that exists beyond the limits of time and space, we haven't yet crossed that threshold. So we must be mindful that in our existing state, each of us only has a limited amount of time. In life, you really can make as much money as you want. And all that's required is putting in the effort to see that it's done. This is where it becomes a challenge for many people who are working those 10 hours a day at minimum wage and they feel like they can't escape the wheel, yet their existing job or jobs take so much energy that they are exhausted and thus drained from being able to pursue their passions or learn a new skill. This is incredibly important to know more than ever right now in 2020 with the change of the economic landscape of the world. Now is the time, the opportunity to create massive transformation in our lives and in the world by taking some time to learn new skills and implement them in the world through our work and our intentions to be in service to humanity. So if you are wanting to generate more wealth, the first thing you have to look at is how much value are you creating in the world? Is the job that you have now limited in how much value you can supply to others? All it takes is honoring both the masculine and the feminine and striving together to create a new paradigm of social harmony. So wrapping up this whole thing, ultimately, as Sifu Dan Locke would say it, for all of us that have struggled with money, it seems as though what we have is not a money problem, but a skill problem. If we can learn some high income skills, especially one relative to our wealth archetype, we can completely transform our financial lives by creating value in the world in a meaningful way that impacts the lives of all of those who your work touches. As we were drafting the finale for our money series, something very important came up to be explored on the subject of resource-based economies 
which is the usage of resources in the world today. Scientists studying how many resources people consume have found that individually, the higher the overall income of a region, the more the people there tend to consume an excess of resources, something especially prevalent in the middle classes. To top it all off, these consumption rates are growing. But instead of being concerned about the growing population, these researchers are worried that the growing demands of our current population are a much bigger threat. For the most part, some of these resources include things like transport and industrial costs like fuel and water. Further, household consumption is seemingly giving rise to more than 60% of global emission. To put that in perspective, that's between 50 and 80% of the total resources that we use. Not only are resources being used unnecessarily, but according to the Journal of Industrial Ecology, the growing consumption rate on food and international goods in households has significant environmental impacts that are just not sustainable. It's thought that one of the main reasons behind this excess spending is the increasing levels of disposable income in our society, enabling consumers to soak up resources far past what is needed for them to survive. Though at first, this may be a depressing thought, it's also an exciting opportunity. More and more people around the world are waking up to issues like our vulnerable environment and social inequality. And actually, it's middle-class citizens who can do the most about it. If a cultural and mindset shift occurred where people agreed to consume less of what they didn't need, a significant amount of pressure could be relieved from our environment. This would hugely free up more resources and help to promote our collective welfare. Now, one of the most important steps we could take to sustain everyone in our current population, as well as growing populations and protect our environment is to collectively make the decision to consume less unnecessary goods. We know the world though, and that is much easier said than done. Baked into many of our modern cultures is the importance and glamor of living a materialist life, one that is ultimately based on consumption. Many people are misguided by their desire to be materially wealthy, so much so that they don't even know what they would do with the money if they had it. Maybe buy a mansion or a nice car or some other quick fixes to the illusion of poverty. But even though most people don't become wealthy in this way, the mindset has trickled down into what is basically a consumer culture. Today, there is always an exciting new version of the thing that you already have that works completely fine. And many people are convinced that the status of owning such things is so important to their lives and their well being. Seriously, I remember in high school that when you got a new pair of shoes, it was like the thing that everyone talked about for a day. Everyone you saw, even people you didn't really know would compliment you on your new shoes. And then the next day, nobody cared. But there was some sort of status associated with getting new shoes. In reality, the addiction to consumption is an ever present issue that functions much in the same way as any other kind of addiction. Many people can relate to the dopamine release of buying something even if you never actually get your money's worth out of it. There really is an effect in your brain that feels good to own the newest things before your friends. In this kind of situation, it's important to be honest and open and approach it from a position of compassion. If buying and spending is something people do to relieve stress, then shaming people for consuming more will only make them feel more stressed and ultimately make the problem worse. What we really need to help make ourselves conscious of our consumption is shifting our sources of satisfaction to something else, such as doing good work, helping others and making connections. This isn't a simple issue, of course, but like any problem, the first step to solving it is looking at it without judgment. Curbing consumption and freeing up resources is something everyone can work on right now. And maybe this is the first step to living in this new kind of world, one where no one is starving or in poverty. It's not all doom and gloom though. While on average, most middle and upper class areas are consuming and polluting more, there are some cities thriving today which live a much more environmentally friendly ideal. Copenhagen in Denmark and Porto Alegre in Brazil are both middle or upper class cities. And yet Copenhagen has experienced both economic growth and emissions reductions by working with local planning programs to make the move towards renewable energy sources way easier. These cities are demonstrations that if a city collectively sets an intention to do something, it can be done. Because as we already know from many new emerging scientific explorations today, intention and observation steers reality. Are there even enough resources in the world to allow everyone to thrive? The answer to this is, as you might've guessed, 
Not so necessarily a simple answer because human life is very complex. And as you attempt to answer one question, it opens up many more. Yet with almost every initial complex problem, it is possible to create solutions. For example, food production can be completely transformed if we were to invest in something like vertical farming, which would lead to a whole new slew of innovations on how we could make something like that possible. As long as we remain open and flexible to new ideas and are willing to invest in ourselves in the long term, there's really no problem we can't solve. But you see, this does take a shift in mindset from thinking of short-term profits to long-term lasting solutions. This is where the whole resource-based economy thing comes in, which is essentially a different kind of economy than capitalism. A system in which all goods and services are available without the use of any system of debt or servitude like money, credits, or barter. All resources become the common heritage of all people, not just a select few. The challenge with this kind of system is that what happens when some individuals create tremendous value for society and others do the bare minimum, yet they both have access to all of the exact same resources. The question arises, is that fair or harmonious? The way we overcome this challenge is with a collective shift in consciousness. And this is something we'll talk about more soon. Now, along the journey to creating a resource-based economy is where central planning systems seemingly enter the conversation. In the face of the logistical challenges of getting separate industries to work together and provide for all people efficiently and effectively, central planning, also known as planned economies, seek to unify and harmonize the control of certain industries. In a nutshell, it's an economic system where a central planning group, such as a government, controls and regulates production, distribution, and prices, among other things, as opposed to the current model where prices allocate resources. This type of system is naturally pretty large scale and ambitious and gets a very bad reputation with certain people in the world for being socialist in nature. Due to the interlocking nature and dependence of the industries which supply necessary goods though, planned economic systems aim to increase efficiency by managing and coordinating multiple massive industries to achieve a single charitable goal. Just getting a system like this off the ground can seem like an impossible task. It's no wonder so many communists throughout history sought change so aggressively. Now, one serious option to achieve a planned economy seeks to do so by more harmonious means though. Something known as the Venus Project is a central planning system with plans to start small and make use of advanced technology to organize societies and distribute resources intelligently. But their vision goes even further for in their own words, they say, we call for a straightforward approach to the redesign of a culture in which the age old inadequacies of war, poverty, hunger, debt, environmental degradation, and unnecessary human suffering are viewed not only as avoidable, but totally unacceptable. Reflecting on that, I feel it is important that as we move forward collectively, we take ideas like this and build them into the framework of new developing systems. The plan to transition to this kind of system exists with the awareness of the failures of more extreme and aggressive pushes to radically transform the capitalist economy, which it's coming from. Instead, these guys are focused on how they can grow organically from inside our current system and have plans to transition from a semi-capitalist starting point to a fully centrally planned city in the long run. The cities and the planning are designed to be universal and scalable, so a small community with merit and interest could easily be grown to accommodate more and more citizens. And in the end game, one without Thanos, new cities like this could be initiated around the world. To some, this may seem like a pipe dream or even a complete impossibility. And it's okay to have your own opinions and feelings on the matter, don't get me wrong. What almost everyone can agree on though regarding the Venus Project are its end goals. No one logically wants to live in a world with war, a hazardous environment, poverty, or unsustainable resource production. What the Venus Project is doing uniquely is stating that actually we don't have to. In fact, we should strive to create an earth without these issues. Without any call to destabilize our current systems or societies, the Venus Project aims to show what progress can be made and allow people to hop on with their success or learn from their mistakes. To learn more about the Venus Project, you can visit their website, which we'll link in the description. Whether you believe global suffering is best solved by central planning or by just everyone doing their part, 
or everything in between, I hope this video has helped in the exploration that we all have a role to play and that we can all make changes today and move forward to reduce waste and excess in our own lives, paving a way for a future with freer resources to share with those less privileged and support for expanding education across the board so that everyone has access not just to resources, but knowledge and wisdom that we can use to make the world a better place. And if you ever feel like the future is hopeless, remember that there is always something you personally can do to make a difference. And that if you make a genuine difference in your own life, it will ripple out. People around you will sense the change. And if enough people do this, amazing things can be accomplished one step at a time. Throughout this series, we've talked a lot about the interconnection between money and spirituality and evolving our spiritual relationship with money as well. And all along the way, we've been striving towards this end goal for the series, ultimately ending with the question, is it possible for everyone on earth to have all of the resources they need, not only to survive, but to live comfortably and in harmony with the world and each other? It is a simple fact that at the moment, our resources are not spread out in a way to reach this goal. But the question is, are there really enough resources in the first place? Our thoughts on this mirrors the thinking of Gandhi, who says, the world has enough for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. Humans have undoubtedly been increasing their density on earth quite rapidly in recent history. In the last 10,000 years, we've gone from no more than several million humans to nearly 8 billion strong. Given our current system of resource management, which for the most part is based on capitalism and the potential growth of the population to 11 billion by the 22nd century, we are in a time unlike any other as the population has never been this high before and there is no historical precedent to tell us whether our current system is sustainable in the long term. But researchers have another concern, not with the number of people, but with our unsustainable rate of consumption, something that we looked at previously. So far, as we've been exploring money and spirituality together, one of the primary comments in the opposition to this exploration has been that the existing financial systems are corrupt because it allows some people to have millions or billions of dollars and others to have absolutely nothing. So of course, a shift to a different kind of financial system for us as a species seems to make sense. Discussions of a resource-based economy often emerges in this kind of conversation, but what is it really going to take to get us there? And can it really work? The challenge here is that we exist in a world of many different systems, and these systems were designed in particular ways based on existing levels of consciousness that we had attained. If we were to watch human evolution over the last several thousand years, we would see this continuum of developing systems and the introduction of new systems as old ones became out of date. This is important for us to realize, especially for those of us who have the mentality of smash the old paradigm, because doing so leaves us with anarchy and may not actually support us in moving to a new, better system for all of humanity. It's for this reason we made the Spiritual Money series at all, as we found that shifting our thinking first, it supports our evolution, instead of just mindlessly rebelling against and destroying something that we don't like. As humanity continues to evolve over the next 10, 20, 50, 100 years and beyond, we should be striving to develop and implement new strategies, solutions, technologies, and most importantly, ways of thinking into our social and economic systems, allowing us to become more in harmony with each other and nature. And when opportunities arise to make quantum leaps, like implementing a full-scale resource-based economy, we shouldn't be afraid to take that leap of faith and try it. Worst case scenario, we fail, providing us with valuable lessons on how to do it better. And then we do it better, and then we win. It's very critical that we realize this, that if we approach money and economic systems with a destructive attitude, we will only create more destruction. Sometimes destruction is necessary, but we must also be mindful that the best approach is a creative one, where destruction of the old is just a natural byproduct as people utilize new technologies in brilliant ways, supporting humanity and becoming more conscious of themselves and the world around them. Looking at the way that our species acts, at least right now, is that not everyone is thinking for themselves. Most humans act like pack animals, following the herd, the ideas, the systems and guidelines that have been established by others around them. Even most of our opinions are not our own, but often a regurgitation of things that we've heard and resonated with in some way. 
Because of this, we are conditioned to fight each other a lot because that's what we are spoon fed so often. Such as, for example, in political media, left wing this, right wing that. Didn't anyone tell the news that the left wing and right wing are a part of the same bird? Anyway, this same challenge seems to be at the heart of why so many people dislike capitalism because there are system builders with a lot of resources at their disposal who implement systems for the masses to follow that generally don't encourage health, wellness, or freedom of thought. However, the seeds of our salvation can be found in the same systems. If free thinkers and system builders could exist within the capitalistic model and implement solutions and systems on a large scale for millions or billions of people to use that encourages connection, health, and wellness, we would see a new world so quickly as humanity collectively wakes up to a higher truth and insists on living more in alignment and harmony with themselves and the universe. The capitalistic model could actually be used to create a resource-based economy without having to see our civilizations collapse in the process. Shifting to a resource-based economy is completely possible, but in order to truly see something like this manifest, we first have to shift our way of thinking. Mindlessly rebelling against the old paradigm won't actually create anything new. It's going to take each of us shifting and living differently until we hit that point of critical mass and enough people act as creators and make something new that replaces the old paradigm altogether. It's for this reason we've been exploring money and spirituality, because we found that it was important to bring a holistic approach to all of the aspects of life. And money is a very root chakra issue a foundational aspect of life that we have to overcome if we want to see the whole world thrive. Part of that is recognizing that even if we existed in poverty for a long time, we don't have to stay there. We can participate in the existing systems and become a conscious creator and change the world around us and even generate resources in the process to do so. Like him or hate him, I feel Elon Musk is a really good example of this. Utilizing the existing systems and technologies he has moved humanity forward in huge ways, such as developing vehicles that are light years ahead of any other vehicle technology. You can literally fall asleep at the wheel of a Tesla and you're almost guaranteed not to crash. Not to mention his other work inspires dreams of colonizing other parts of the solar system. So the question then becomes, what are you creating in your life actively? What are your dreams in life? And in what ways are you moving towards them? If you are someone who has unconsciously allowed the world to crush your dreams and get the better of you, don't worry, you're not alone. And there is good news, there's something you can do about it. It all begins with a shift in consciousness, a shift in thinking. When you look at the world differently, look at limitations and see opportunities, it empowers you with the freedom to behave differently too, to take actions rooted in possibility. It is only when we believe the existing story when we believe that there is nothing we can do about the circumstances of our lives, that we are disempowered to do anything about it. Today, I'd like to invite you to cast off your limitations where you have them. Go inside and connect with your dreams, your vision for your life, and then begin to move towards it. And if you don't know where to start and you're looking for some help, you are invited to come and check out our special nine hour long masterclass called Spiritual Money Mastery. This workshop goes deep into everything we've learned about money as energy and how to utilize money as a tool for being in service to humanity. The more that we collectively shift this perspective, the faster we can create a new paradigm of life for us all. With that, thank you so much for joining us.